So it's my pleasure to welcome everyone today to the Teaching Development Conference 2022 at Queen's. Um, I'm welcoming everyone on behalf of the Center for Teaching and Learning. My name is Carolyn McRae, and I work as an educational developer at the Center, um, focusing on graduate student and postdoctoral fellow professional development. Before we get started, I would like to start the day with a land acknowledgement. So where we gather today in Queen's University occupies the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee people. I am a settler and uninvited guest on this land, um, where I have been for 10 years making my home and work. Um, you know, I've, I've been on this land for a number of years, but I've been recently working more towards understanding what my responsibilities are to the land, to the Indigenous people who have cared for and still care for the land to this day, um, and to uh, my own professional responsibilities um, towards reconciliation in my work in higher education. When thinking about land acknowledgements, it's also important for us to consider why we do a land acknowledgement and to understand the reasons for it. It's certainly about understanding the physical space that we occupy today, but it's more than that. It's understanding the colonial history and how we perpetuate colonialism at this institution and what we can now do to decolonize and indigenize the university space. Um, it's especially important also to recognize how we dismantle settler colonialism through land back and through understanding our collective responsibility towards land back and understanding um, relational reciprocity to the indigenous people of this place. And finally, it needs to move beyond spoken words, especially what I'm doing today, and understand that it needs to be shown in our actions um, and move beyond a tokenistic land acknowledgement. I invite you all throughout the day today to think about what this means to you and what your role and responsibility might be as a student, educator, researcher, and member of the Queens and Kingston community. Um, in joining us today, so welcome to Queens if you are new and welcome back uh, on campus if you might have been away for the last few years. Um, and to a new academic year that we're starting. Um, this event, the Teaching Development Conference, is hosted by the Center for Teaching and Learning. We are the academic support unit on campus to support all educators with your teaching and learning needs. This is one of our signature events. It's held annually in September, um, and it often covers a number of different topics on teaching and learning. And it's a chance to learn from each other, a chance to network and get to learn from um, others on campus who may or may not be in your discipline and who may be doing something very innovative and unique that you want to learn. I sat in this audience um, in September 2012 as a first year master's student, so I feel extremely honored to welcome everyone today 10 years later. Um, we do have a big program planned for this morning, um, including our plenary discussion um, and some breakout concurrent sessions. And I will get into a few housekeeping notes, but first I'd like to introduce um, a warm welcome to Dr. John Pierce, um, the Vice Provost of Teaching and Learning, to share a few words in opening for our day today. Thanks, Caroline. Uh, welcome, everybody. I'd add my welcome to that, um, uh, to the Teaching Development Conference. Interesting thing for you to know, this is its 22nd year, so it's been a long-standing thing. It's one of the most um, uh, popular things that the Center for Teaching and Learning does. Um, so I hope you all have a good day here. Um, I think there's two reasons that we're here. Our enthusiasm for teaching, but maybe more importantly, our enthusiasm for learning. And that's what the day is. The day is about learning about all the aspects of teaching and learning, because, of course, it's not just presenting material in a classroom. It's the whole experience of student life. Uh, all of that enters into the world we work in, and we always have to be sensitive to that and aware of what that, uh, that responsibility brings to us all. So that's something I'd have you think about, is that it's not just presenting those lesson plans, but it's all the other stuff that's actually tougher than the lesson plan material. Um, so it's thinking about those things as we do our, our, do our work in the classroom and outside the classroom. Um, so I hope this uh, conference gives you an opportunity to reflect on your own practices and develop your practices um, as you go along. I've obviously been teaching for a number of years and I always learn new things. It's always about new, new learning, new experiences, new teaching methodologies, and that's what makes this work so exciting and certainly has kept me engaged for, for all the time I've been at Queen's, um, which I won't go into the number of years that is, but I'll say it's, it's kind of a long time. In fact, one shocking moment for me was when I learned that one of my graduate students wasn't born at the date that I came to Queens. So that'll give you just an idea of this. 
Um, so since we're back in person, and this is the most amazing, uh, exciting thing for all of us, certainly for me, uh, it'll give you that new experience of talking to other people, making connections, because um, that's crucial. I know that certainly when I teach, I always talk to my colleagues about what they're doing, talk to my graduate students about what they're doing, my TAs, staff, everybody who supports the teaching experience. It's great to hear from all of them. So, so I encourage you to talk to each other during the breaks, get to know each other, and um, um, enjoy that part of this as well. Finally, I would also encourage you to seek out the Center for Teaching and Learning. There's incredible resources there, a really positive framework for teaching and learning, um, and they will help you connect with other educators throughout this. So they provide a lot of support for you here. So a lot to look at today. I uh, hope you have a great time, learn a lot there, um, and I will turn it back to Carolyn for the start of the conference. Thanks, everybody. Um, and so with that, we'll get started with the plenary. Um, and welcome to everyone, and we hope you have a great morning. So hello everyone, welcome. My name is Yasmin Jarbal, and I am an educational developer here at the Center for Teaching and Learning in anti-racist and inclusive pedagogies. I just realized that I still had my mask on, and it's, it might be easier to, to read my lips if you need to. Um, it's a pleasure seeing so many of you here today, um, and I look forward to uh, meeting you in some of the sessions and perhaps in the hall and throughout the year or the years that you are here uh, at Queen's. I have the immense pleasure to introduce you to today's panel and panelists. So um, in conversation with Carolyn, we tried to think about ways that we could bring all of the folks here today about a common theme that was important to hopefully all of us. The global pandemic has shifted much of the ways in which we live, we connect with one another, teach and do research. As Arundhati Roy has beautifully argued in a 2020 article, quote, pandemics have historically forced humans to break with the past and imagine the world anew. And this pandemic is no different, end quote. The pandemic, she says, is a portal, a gateway between one world and the next. And this is where today's panel lays for me. As educators, we know that a return to the status quo pre-pandemic, whatever that means, isn't viable and is not possible. We must think anew our pedagogies, our teaching practices, and how we connect with one another, with our students, and with our colleagues. We need to sift through the practices we want to keep and the ones we need to let go of. And in addition to the everyday struggles that we live through, the conversion of or the convergence of multi-layered global crises, including the pandemic, climate catastrophes, and wars around the world, have a real impact on our students, but also on ourselves who come from these parts of the world. And as educators such as yourselves, we have an important role to play in fostering environments that support mental health, well-being, um, and belonging and understanding of these struggles and how they can impact students' lives. For educators, this means attending to our own mental health and well-being, as well as adopting strategies to support students in our classrooms and in the broader teaching and learning contexts and landscapes at Queen's. This panel discussion features three superstar champions for mental health uh, from uh, the 2021 and 2022 um, uh, period, and they have been um, um, select. Oh, I can't. There is a word that's not coming to my mind. Yes, thank you. Yes, thank you, Dan. They have been nominated by their students uh, for all of the work that they have done for them. And so while Joanne Ferreira uh, had to send her regrets today, it is my absolute pleasure to introduce you to our three panelists. Um, first, I will go with Dan. So Dan Vena is assistant professor in the Department of Film and Media Studies and works at the intersections of visual and popular cultures, uh, genre cinemas, horror and monster movies, feminist, queer, trans histories of classical ho Hollywood, amongst other things. He is committed to decolonial, anti-racist, queer, trans, disabled, anti-capitalist, and neurodivergent collaborative world-making. 
But what you all need to know is that Dan has a superpower. Um, and he is one of the nicest, most wonderfulest people I personally know. Um, and he has, I've seen him with students, um, and he has this absolute talent to capture their attention in ways I've never seen before. Uh, so this is Dan. Um, <laughs> um, I will introduce you to Megan next. Uh, Megan Ingram is a master's student in the Department of Sociology, and their research lays at the intersections of critical disability studies, sociology of mental health, oh, sorry, yes, yeah, sociology, mental health, and medicine, queer theory, crip theory, and feminist theories. They deeply care about learning and researching as a collaborative and curious process that involves everyone in the space in relation, and how dynamics of access and care show up in those spaces. Megan's superpower is that they are one of the most committed and passionate people I know. Their passion is absolutely contagious and deeply inspiring. And then last but not least, Paul Bumak uh, just graduated in March uh, with a PhD in epide epidemiology in the Department of Public Health Sciences. He was born and raised in Bangkok, Thailand, and completed his MD degree in Bangkok's Chulam Long Korn University. Thank you. <laughs> I've been practicing. Um, Paul received his general medical practice license in 2015 and then turned his attention to research and the stigma of mental health issues. His research focus um, is, is around mental health and immigrant uh, patients and, and newcomers to the country, if I understand that right. Yeah, they are. I extend it to multicultural population, but yeah. That's Thank it. you. <laughs> With most of the immigrant population. Excellent. Thank you. Um, and I just met Paul today. Um, but I use my superpowers <laughs> to get to know what his superpowers were. Um, and Paul said that uh, his superpower or a superpower he wished he had was to read minds in order to better understand and support and help people. So please help me in welcoming our wonderful panelists today. All right, so we've prepared a number of questions for our panelists today, but we're going to start with one that I think is a bit um, more open for them to give us a sense um, of what does student or wellness in general mean to you? And I think we'll start with Dan. Uh, I'll take my mask so uh, those who need to read lips can. Uh, so first off, I just want to say thank you for inviting me to the panel and to have me think with others. Um, but I am no bastion of mental health. I'm actually on medical leave right now because I am unwell. Um, so don't I don't want to pretend as though I have some like divine answer to this problem other than I am trying to figure it out with the rest of you. Uh, for me, I want to answer the question in relation to student wellness or how I conceptualize student wellness on campus. For me, uh, student wellness is not about the individual, but rather the community and supporting students as parts of community, particularly marginalized or often decentered communities, especially on the Queens campus, where we have had a history of acts of violence against marginalized communities. And for those who are new to the Queen's campus, uh, a lot has been reported in the journal and the conversation, and you could find those incidents so you could become more aware of the challenges students here are facing. Uh, but for me, student wellness has to be about, if not safety, some sort of security or place of safety and ensuring that your classroom is not one that is actively harming students but instead protecting them making them feel okay and well enough to learn i think what i try to tell my students often is you can't learn if your head is thinking about where you're going to get your next meal if you've slept if you're working for 12 hours and then going to class so you have to kind of conceptualize your classroom as a place for them to have a moment where they could 
choose to engage with the learning process to the degree that they physically and mentally can. And I think it takes a lot for us as instructors to decenter our ego and be like, I want my students to be the perfect students all the time and they should be listening to me and why don't they care about the classical Hollywood history? I'm telling them like, that's revolutionary. Um, but it's not and it's okay that what you're teaching is not the end of the world, but giving them them, your time and attention and making them feel like they have a place to go to is something that is very valuable. So I think we have to, we have to take our own egos out of it as instructors. All right, I'll pass it to you, Megan. Yeah. Thank you so much, Dan. Um, I want to echo what Dan has mentioned about student wellness being inherently related to community, because I think that a big part of caring for your students and making a positive environment in your classroom is recognizing that learning is inherently uncomfortable. Um, everything about the university experience, especially for those of you who are going to be teaching first years, they're learning not just course content, but how to be a person and how to be independent and how to navigate a really sort of specific and jargon dense environment. Um, and that's going to look really different for a lot of people, depending on the context that they're coming from. Um, and a big part of caring for your students and creating student wellness is recognizing, like Dan has said, like putting your ego aside and recognizing that your class is just one part of a really multifaceted life that your students are engaging in and that your course may not be a priority and that that's actually okay. Um, and a big part for me of caring for students and advocating for student wellness is learning what success looks like and how students individually define that for themselves. Um, because for some people it's going to be passing and for some people it is going to be getting high marks and for some people it's just going to be making it through the day. And all of those are equally valid ways to navigate the university environment. And I think that that is something that I really like to keep in the forefront of my mind when I'm thinking about student wellness. <laughs> Sounds good. Hi everybody and uh, what really lovely uh, responses. I have to think of like yeah like what what to add to that. Um, especially Dan I really like the concept that you tie wellness into you know community because that's what you know we're going you know together as a whole right. Um, in classroom when I try to conceptualize wellness I, I I come down to, you know, the, uh, for me, the definition of that would be like the ability to be, you know, oneself. So how well that, you know, a person can kind of function in whatever roles that they have. And like Megan was saying, the role of being a student, of learning, the role of functioning as an adult or a young adult, or, you know, just a role of going to the grocery store and buy food. Um, I, to me, that's that's wellness. And you know, as someone who not just a TA in a class or you know a, a, a teaching person in a class, which was one of my roles, my other role is to kind of you know extend my arms and then to understand you know if their wellness, how is everybody's wellness is you know in in a class or in with anyone that I interact with. So that's kind of my main you know sort of philosophy when I go into a class. You know, every, I, everybody has different levels of wellness, you know, things that happen in their life that I don't know. So I try to be open and then use that definition that I have, kind of, you know, slowly understand the things that are happening in everybody's lives, not in the nosy kind of way, but in a way that I can help, you know, they, you know, as much as I can navigate through, you know, like Megan was saying, life in university, which is actually kind of, kind of difficult. Um, um, yeah, with, um, you know, as a person who's been through like, you know, in the a learner's role and also a teaching role. So yeah, so that would probably be my, my definition of wellness. Thank you so much to the three of you. Um, I think that uh, student wellness and mental health doesn't just happen in the classroom and isn't just for students. As educators, um, Dan, maybe you can start. What kind of advice would you offer to other educators, either just starting or continuing? Uh, I think we we're, I th hopefully we're in a room of those who are just starting their kind of journey as instructors or some have already uh, been doing that work for quite a while. Um, it's scary and that's part of it. So embrace that uh, if this is kind of your beginning foray into it. Uh, but in terms of advice I have for other educators, 
Your job as an educator is care work, and I think we need to radically shift our paradigm of what education is towards a care-centered model. And that means that you have to understand your responsibility is one of, of care. Not necessarily, as Paul's saying, to like, you know, mother, father, or gender neutral parent them, but rather in the sense of actually showing presentness, mindfulness, compassion, and centering those kind of values in your classroom ahead of the kind of nuts and bolts content that you're expected to get through in your sessions. And yes, of course, students need to learn content so they could do well on an exam or do an essay properly, of course. But that will come if they feel like they are in a comfortable place. A student can't learn when they're having a panic attack. A student can't learn when they're thinking about all these other things. But if you do an opening mindfulness exercise, I like to do a few deep breaths and ask folks, do you feel ready for being in the class? And if you don't, don't worry, go have a drink of water, come back when you feel ready. Giving people an option into their own education is now, I think, part of our jobs. And I don't think this is a norm, and I think it is up to us to make it a norm. And in terms of how we could kind of keep rallying for new changes, as Yasmin was pointing out, we have to understand that education is care work, and thus education must be anti-capitalist and anti-corporate in the sense that we need to stop this kind of obsession on productivity, as Megan was saying, right? Like success could look like other things. It doesn't have to mean that everybody in your lab gets an A. What it can mean though is everybody feels moderately okay in your lab. Like, you know, like it can be a new definition of what education is. And measuring your success as an instructor or the success of your students on a very colonial capitalist mindset needs to start to change. Because as Carolyn pointed out, right, we can't just give a land acknowledgement and keep living our lives as if we should not or cannot be invested in taking down a system that has inherently disenfranchised so many. So as an educator, you have to start to understand your role as part of this larger call to action, right? A larger call to action to decolonize, to um, recenter people's wellness, because this system doesn't. As a grad student, you will quickly learn how little the system cares for your well-being. But if you can give that effort and attention to your students, they could bring that effort and attention into the world with them so that the worlds that they experience outside of here start to become more supportive, more understanding. And we have to set that bar here for them. It's not, this is not the place to grind them into the ground. This is the place to show them what a different and better world looks like so that they could create that world when they leave this place, <laughs> which hopefully they do. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so yeah, thinking about student wellness as happening like beyond the classroom as well, um, I think a really big part for me is centering access. And that looks like going beyond the resources that QSAS is going to offer your students and is going to offer you. Um, and QSAS is a great resource, but it also is based in the logics that Dan has talked about, which are colonial and capitalist and inherently focused on productivity. Yes, QSAS. It's Queen Student Accessibility Services, for those of you who do not know. It's my bad. Um, yeah, and so looking to center access in your classroom and going beyond just what is going to be provided for students who have access to accommodations. Because a large portion of your students who might 
identify as disabled or have disabilities may not have access to those accommodations because of financial barriers or cultural barriers or just an inability to have the energy to navigate an inherently like really paperwork heavy system um, and also just the cost of medical notes notes and paperwork and things like that. And so when I think about access in the classroom and showing up for students and having wellness sort of expand beyond, um, for me, it looks like showing an interest in what they actually need to succeed. Um, for me, that looks like before my tutorials at the start of semester, I have a survey that I send out that asks anonymously is there anything that is not being met by the bureaucratic system that I can offer you in the classroom? And sometimes that's like having a more dim area of the classroom for people with sensory needs. Sometimes that is making sure that you have access to a clear mask because people are immunocompromised but still need to lip read. Um, and it's getting curious and really asking those questions and making sure that yeah, you may not have a lot of control over like the physical environment because you do just get assigned an instructional space, but doing what you can to make that space somewhere where people can actually learn. Um, and so, yeah, really building rapport beyond what is necessarily required of the institution is what I would say. And and I think I'd like to echo, you know, Megan's point too, as like be, you know, as being present to you know to the students I understand that not everybody's going to teach the same class i i taught math and it's really hard to put in you know wellness into the conversation when you're you know doing integrals and and try to find p-values and stuff like that um and and class sizes too right the, um, i taught a class where it's um you know like the whole of i know all the first years in bio students so that's i don't know each class is like 200 students and there's like five of us just walking around making sure they understand our codes and stuff like that so and the other on the other hand you know last year i ran tutorials almost independently but also math but you know the the the, the size is a lot smaller so it will depend on how you you know present yourself to you know to your students just to make sure that you know they have access and that you're there if they need anything um so so I guess you know be kind of you know think about that what kind of what kind of TA you would like when you are you know um, when you're a student right you want them to listen to you when you have you know questions or any issues that they have in their life and just be there for them sometime most of the time I would say what people need is just someone to listen um, and most of the time I just listen and then they will feel better and without having to do anything um, but to add on to that you know. So equip yourself with a little bit of, you know, information, you know, what are there resources on campus that you can point to um, or yourself is yourself, you know, as much as you can know what resource you can provide. And, you know, like everybody's saying, it's hard to be, I hope like I, I was thinking that assuming that everybody here mostly are graduate students. So there are lots of things going on in your life as well. So how much you, you know, what is your limit and how you can give, you know, how much you can give to, to other people. And that's on the wellness side, but then, you know, also there's content and stuff like that. But I'm sure everybody is well equipped. Sometimes you will think that you're not equipped and you will be, you know, or you're very nervous about, you know, teaching you, do I know enough? Do you know about this topic or that topic? What if students ask me this and that? Know that you do already. Um, it just takes a little bit of time to kind of get used to the idea that, hey, you're actually good at this. <laughs> um, and, um, and you, yeah, you'll get immensely confident, you know, as, as you progress. I also want to jump in. I know we've been talking kind of in the framework of teaching assistants and uh, graduate students, but I also know that we might have uh, new faculty and adjuncts here today. And I want to kind of address them or folks at least in the room who have maybe some control over curriculum and how the curriculum is going to be uh, kind of structured. Because as TAs, I understand it's hard. You kind of get the syllabus. That's it is what it is. And you only really have kind of control of the relational interactions in your class rather than the marking schemes etc cetera, etc cetera. but if you do have the ability to advocate either for a curriculum or to actually design it I think Megan's kind of uh, call towards thinking about what success is also has to go towards our curriculum design so what is a deadline why are deadlines necessarily 
how could we think of deadlines that are more accessible? Uh, how could we think about lateness penalties? Do we need them? Could they be, is there a new way to think about them in terms of accessibility? Um, what are participation marks? Do we need them? How about for students who cannot actually physically attend due to mental health? But it doesn't mean that they're not invested in the course, it's just that they're doing it in a way that they can. Um, so there's all these kind of components and facets to the curriculum that we have to ask ourselves, I think as instructors and designers, what system are we protecting when we keep these things in place? This is, again, to speak back to what Carolyn was saying, this call towards decolonization. Why is it that we have these kind of arbitrary, like I know in my department there's some sort of arbitrary, 3% every day you don't hand it in. I don't know where that number came from, I never use it, it to me it doesn't make any sense. And so for me I have to ask, what system am I protecting by upholding these, these actually really inaccessible types of ways of working? And when I opened it up and I did different things in my class, like I said, well you have to get assignment one in by this day. Um, that worked a lot better when I said, you have a week to get it in that assignment. So let your TA know, like, you know, communicate with us. If you need more time, we'll work with you. But it was a much more successful system than having students stay up 24 hours, finish the assignment, come in the next day, totally mentally fried, they're very ill, and then I have to, frankly, read the paper they wrote in 24 hours, and nobody wants that. <laughs> and I like really tell them that. I'm like, I don't wanna read what you write in 24 hours, and they're like, fair enough. Like, they know too, right? They're not like lying to you. They're like, yeah, it's not good. Um, so it's like, for everybody's benefit, let's just sleep on this, okay? Um, but that requires you to say, like, education has to be consensual. We have to develop relationships relational communications about our education. And that idea of consent is a model that Lindsey Brandt talks a lot about in terms of indigenous pedagogies, which I learned through the CTL, that, I, that really clicked to me. I said like, yes, students have to consent as much as we have to consent, and we have to create this curriculum together. And sure, as Paul's mentioning, maybe it's a little less glamorous to do that in math, but in the humanities, it's actually like quite easy to do it because we're thinking about different ways of seeing the world already. But there, it's not to say it's impossible in the sciences and the maths, but if you have that opportunity, take it, because we are trying to redefine education. We're not trying to just do the same thing but like slightly better kind of thing. Thank you so much. I, I think there, there, I really want to echo some of the things that you've said already, but to me, in terms of thinking about what this consent means with your students, um, I, I, I really think that checking in regularly throughout the semester with your students uh, through, you know, entry tickets or exit tickets, so they are, you know, you can ask them to take a piece of paper in the beginning of the class or at the end of the class um, and ask them questions, how they're doing, how they are handling, you know, the content that you're providing, how you can help them improve uh, their understanding or their grades, et cetera, is going to be really important. And to me, it's really about modeling these behaviors. Um, when they ask, for example, a question that you don't know the answer to, to just say that. And I think it's so important to just model that behavior and be okay with not knowing. Um, and then doing the research and coming back the next week and saying that, you know, like I've researched it and this is what I have fi found out. Um, and so I think to me, it's really about thinking about these instructors that have inspired you also in your teaching careers and learning careers as students. Um, and really trying to take away these good um, practices that you have so much enjoyed. However, keep in mind that the things that you like don't actually work with everyone. <laughs> um, and I think that this is really an important piece that um, I, I really had to learn hard is that, you know, whatever I was passionate about, not everyone was passionate about. Uh, I am a Virgo, I like discipline, I like deadlines, but not everyone's like that. And so really 
really thinking about um, transforming these practices and, and giving options. Um, and you know, um, you you Dan talked about some of the, the the services and supports that we offer at the Center for Teaching and Learning. Um, we have workshops throughout the year uh, for graduate students and faculty members to think about these practices and how we can employ them in our teaching. Um, but we also have a website, so please go on it and you can look at some of these strategies that you can employ every day. Um, and again, I think that it's really important to know your resources. How many of you here are going to be uh, teaching assistants or teaching fellows in the next year? Yeah. Whoa, that's a majority of you. That's amazing. Um, and how many of you might be doing this for the first time? Yes. <laughs> well done. Yes. <laughs> well done. <laughs> So one of the things I think I'd like to echo that was I know was kind of brought across the panel subtly, but was that if, if, if you're doing this for the first time, this can be, you know, a bit nerve wracking. It can be a little scary. You can feel like you don't know what you're doing. And I think it's important to know that that's normal. Like it is normal to have uncertainties about what's happening, especially as a TA, when you, you might not have control over these different elements of the course and you're walking in and oh, you haven't met with the prof yet. You don't know what your TA, I, I talked to folks yesterday who were like, I don't know what my TA ship looks like yet. And I start on Tuesday. Normal. Um, but I think what's also important is that having these conversations can be a bit overwhelming because there are so many options and you can think about, you know, how do, how do we change a course, a, like the program, the system, the university. But I think it's also important to remember that you can start by changing one thing here and then change mm -hmm. another thing. Mm -hmm. and, and so thinking in small pieces too about what do you maybe have the, the power to start thinking about and changing now um, and then starting to build up upon that. And that's where kind of we can start to build change um, in a way that's not saying, hey, as a TA, go in and try to change the whole course. Because um, it's just not, it's not gonna happen. Um, but it's about thinking of all of these little pieces put together um, that you can start doing. Yeah, and I, I think I'd like to add that because we you know I'm seeing a lot of hands doing it for the first time. I was really nervous, like really, really nervous. And it was a, a well, design course like you know there are roles that you have to do right um so that was about like three years ago when i started my, my phd here um but then you know doing one thing at a time like you know instead of just going in and then be like okay so let me look at your codes you know what they look like you know what's your answer like start by asking like how they're doing like you know how what, so you know how's your weekend or you know what do you know it's midterm season, like, so how are you doing otherwise, you know, in, in this crazy university life? Um, and these were undergrads, and some of them are like, you know, first years and second years. So start by doing that, and then you build onto that. And then they'll know that, oh yeah, like this TA seems to like care. And this is like a class where it's like, like 20, 30 TAs, right? So they'll start seeing that, okay, so Paul is, you know, someone I can talk to, and then they'll kind of, you know, start talking to you. They'll be like, okay, um, yeah, I really don't understand this. Um, and yeah, but I just went to, you know, I mean, I, I feel so old. What is that nightclub thing that, yeah, like they just went to that place like last <laughs> night and it was crazy, you know, like, yeah, then you get enough sleep. So you know their stories and then you kind of, oh, of course, like, if you go clubbing last night, you're not gonna be able to understand <laughs> math today. Like, you know, so, so you know that they're not in the headspace that they can take a lot, you know, right now, but it doesn't mean that they can't. It doesn't mean that they don't have the ability to do that. It's just not the time. And that's okay, right? I mean, when you're undergrad, you just go out and have drinks with friends and, and that's okay. So do one thing at a time and then it will just kind of really go on and it will come really naturally. Like, you know, the, the, the class in the fall that I TA'd where I, I ran a tutorial, it was really natural. Like you started to be proactive, right? You know that you know midterms are coming, so you start asking people how you are, making sure that they prepare. So that not only helped them in terms of their you know mental health, but also with the class, because you know these things are interconnected. Like they're not just you do well in the class with having bad mental. They have to you know be all together. So okay, that, all that to say is I do little change, one thing at a time. You feel powerless, but you can do it. And then one day you look back and be like, oh my god, I made quite quite a number of differences. Yeah, I just want to add on to what Paul has mentioned there about making one little change and also speak to Carolyn's sort of mention that like it can be incredibly overwhelming to have so many choices. And I just want to iterate that like just because you start doing things one way at the beginning of the semester does not mean that you need to do them the same the rest of the semester. <laughs> you do not need to commit to doing something and then not be able to back out. Um, 
everything that you do, you can make a choice each time that you enter that classroom to either try and build on that or to change it entirely because some things are really going to work for some classrooms and then really not work for other classrooms. And that's actually completely fine. Um, and you'll sort of get a feel for it probably by about like mid semester with like what your students are actually really vibing with, with your teaching style. And so I just want to make it really clear that like, if things aren't working, you can change them. And that doesn't mean that you're a failure. It doesn't mean that you're doing something inherently wrong and you can make a difference and make a change at any point in time. Sorry, Grant, do you mind? <laughs> <laughs> I'll jump on that. Um, actually, in fact, you're, um, you're much more proactive if you're changing things as you go versus a teacher who's like, we're doing it this way. And students are like, it's really not working for me. You're like, that's the way we're doing it. Um, like that is not a very reactive relational teacher. So in fact, changing things as you go is, is quite a good thing. Um, and as Paul is mentioning these kind of opening like check-ins, I like to use it. It's something called Mentimeter. It's just M-E-N-T-I. Um, it's anonymous. So I throw up pictures of cats and I'm like, what cat are you today? And it'll be like an angry cat and like a sad cat and or a happy cat. And usually it's like the miserable cat, but I'll be like, okay, that's all right. Don't worry about it. We're going to like try and be like a little bit happier today. So, but like you could get a sense of where your students are in the room. The other thing I like to ask my students is um, on the Mentimeter. So it's anonymous. I said, do you think you can make it through the whole class today? Uh, will you have trouble focusing today? Uh, do you think you'll have to leave halfway through because it's not a good day for like I give them these options of like you can take some agency right and if they're gonna leave I say no problem but you know just make sure you get to the stuff because it's important but if you can't do it you can't do it and I'd rather have you not sleep in the corner like go home and sleep like that's a better place so like giving them these kind of anonymous surveys that shows them hey, like, I know you're a human being. You're not a robot. I'm not a robot. Like, it's okay. But just know if you make that choice, the other end is that you won't have the kind of, you won't have me to help, but that's okay. You could do the work on your own. So having them understand that choices have different, like, repercussions, and those repercussions aren't good or bad. It's just like, okay, that is what it is, and you can make that choice. And I think helping them make choices allowing yourself to make choices in your own teaching is what's going to lead to these new paradigms. If you kind of keep this idea of like, if teaching is care work, what is the one thing I could do today to show that I care? Right? And then as Paul and Megan saying, you could change that thing every time. But if you start with that approach, what I am doing is care work, then that's where that action is gonna come from. So that has to be a paradigm that you're embracing. And you know, you might disagree with me and that's fine, we could talk about it, but if that's something that resonates with you, then that's gonna be the place where these actions come from. So one of the things I'm also hearing from a lot of the comments is yeah. thinking about that was, good. that was good so one of the things i'm also hearing is is you know getting feedback from students and talking to students about the choices that we're making in the classroom and like what is working what do you enjoy that we're doing and what isn't because it's okay if there's stuff that isn't working because that's the type of thing that okay mid-semester we can change um, and so being open to getting feedback from students and having that relationship that you can talk to students about, you know, about the choices that you're making in the class and why you're making those choices and that you're open to if something's not working to, to discussing what could work better. Of course, this, this is harder in, in different classes. It's knowing your context. Do you have a class of 300 or 400? The changes might look different than in a small seminar of 20 students. Um, but that's okay. It's about taking that context and thinking about thinking creatively on how do we make those changes and adaptations based on the context that we're in. Um, I was very open with my students in the last course I taught to say, I'm not going to do any marking on the weekends. So I'm not putting any deadlines on Fridays because I don't want you handing it in on Friday because I'm not going to mark it on the weekend anyway. <laughs> so my, my, my deadlines were Monday and Tuesday. And then I was really honest with students on one week and I said, yeah, I got a busy week. I'm not going to do any marking this week. So if you want to hand it in a week later. Yeah, we're good with that because I was telling my students, I'm human too, and I also have things going on, and I had the flexibility in my course to adjust deadlines like that. Super easy based on my schedule, and so thinking about having those conversations with students to say, what is going to work for all of us? Um, and, and really, it's about their learning. It wasn't really about me and my marking deadlines for me personally, 
but it was about let's have a conversation with the students about what's going to be the best for the learning in this space and in this time. So sometimes um, in teaching roles, we've got different teaching teams and you're gonna have different responsibilities depending on how you are on that teaching team. Um, TAs play a very important role at the university. Um, they, they play a very important role in courses because they're often the kind of liaison and communication first point of contact for students within these courses. Um, and TAs play a very important role in fostering belonging and helping students' uh, well-being and mental health in, in the classroom. There are certain limits, though, to what a TA can do to support their students. They don't have control over maybe something like deadlines or about how curriculum is, is set up. Um, they don't often get to design the assessments or a lot grade distributions. But, you know, we have a question maybe specifically to start with Megan and Paul. Um, can you share some, stra some other strategies that teaching assistants can employ in their labs or tutorials or seminars that might help some students in the classroom? I'll, I'll, I'll start then. Um, it's, it, it was hard for me the, at, at first. And I mean, I was like, I, I do care about, you know, mental health. Like that was something that I'm, I was fat, passionate about as in, you know, looking at the, not just the medical side of things, but also like, you know, like how can I actually improve how people, you know, feel. And I remember the first class I taught, it was, like I said, it was a big stats, undergrad um, stats course. Um, it was mandatory. So you had people who wanted to be there and people who didn't want to be there. Um, no, I had zero control in terms of the content and stuff like that. So I just had to go by, by the book in terms of, okay, this week, this is what we're teaching. I just go around the room and then do it. Um, I guess it's similar to what I was you know, saying earlier is that you, you want to be present and sometimes that's easy, uh, but the the I think the good way to do it is to be you know proactive and be personal. So you don't treat student as just you know like student A B C D. You, they have names and they have lives and all that stuff. So start by thinking you know, like I think that is the it's the easiest part and that's where it starts and then you start to care like you start to be like okay so you know how's it going with the you know with the coding the assignment and then they'll open up to you more right you'll be like you know i really don't like working in group environments oh why can we do to our extent right we wanted students to work together but if they're really comfortable working with themselves that's okay too and then you know then then you know we'll we'll pay a little bit of attention and then they'll treat them as like a you know a, a single group and you start you know going there um and then, you know, it, it goes on from that. And they'll reach out to you. Um, they'll reach out to you about, you know, like this assignment, what it means and stuff like that. And these things are in the scope of what you're supposed to be doing anyway. You're not changing the curriculum, but you, what you have is that you have access to the students and then they, they're kind of, you know, come to you. Um, and at the end of the day, like it's a positive experience for both, you know, for, for the students and also for myself too. Because I feel like I'm doing something that's, meaningful and i'm not just a robot you know because some courses they just really need a you know like a head and a mouth to kind of you know talk go over the points right uh, but um but yeah like it, it it makes you feel good about yourself and it also make a difference in in the uh, student side as well mm -hmm. without changing anything about the course yeah totally i just want to echo what paul has said there and also say that a lot of the times as a TA, yes, you don't have control over what exactly you're doing, but you do have control over how you're doing it and how you speak to the students around you. Um, and that extends also into the way that you give feedback on assignments. It extends into the way that you use tone in your emails. Um, it's not just in the verbal aspects of your classroom. Um, it's really making sure that you are extending that aspect of care and warmth and letting students know that they are not an inconvenience. Um, because a lot of students, um, even going into upper years, haven't yet learned really how to self-advocate. Um, and they feel uncomfortable asking for what they need or they feel uncomfortable even having needs in the first place. Um, and so it's really important to really sort of reward verbally or over email people who have the courage to really stand up for themselves and say, this is what I need, or like I'm looking for an extension and I don't know how to go about doing this. Um, and really just say like, thank you for reaching out, like really making it super clear that you appreciate that they're in that space with you. Um, 
and also again not making them feel like a burden even though sometimes you have a immense email inbox and it might feel like a burden to you not letting that translate into the way that you're responding into your emails um, and really just saying like it's not a worry you're going to be okay um, and so just yeah the way that you approach your students the way you speak to them um, even just like open body language things these are all just like classic um, but I had sort of a different experience. I um, am in sociology, which is sort of a smaller sort of approach. And so I had tutorials last year of like 25 students each. So it's a little bit easier to learn names and build rapport and really do that kind of work. Um, but the big thing that I also had control over was how I graded participation. And so this might be a factor in your tutorials as well or in any sort of work that you're doing. And for me, circling back to what Dan had mentioned earlier about instructors needing to sort of change the way that they grade and really have a paradigm shift. For me, when I'm grading participation, I really try to make sure that I am not only centering verbal participation. I'm not only centering people who are able to speak up because the people who are able to speak up in class generally are people who have a decent amount of privilege, who have learned how to navigate that environment already, who feel comfortable enough in that space to begin to have a voice. And so some people won't speak up and it's not because they don't have good ideas and it's not because they don't want to share, but it's because they're too uncomfortable. And so finding ways to really pull in different aspects of participation, um, whether that's like, hey, if you have a great idea, but you don't feel comfortable speaking up in class, shoot me an email, um, whether that's sort of initiating small group work, whether it's paying attention to people who are like really intently listening to their classmates, just really picking up on all of those other aspects as best as you can um, and really making sure that you're valuing all of the different ways that people are engaging in that work beyond just speaking up. Um, and yeah, those are sort of the main ways that I look to sort of care for students in the classroom with what limited control you have as a TA. I'm just yeah. oh. really, really quick. I know, I know. <laughs> I know I'm not a TA. I'm so sorry. But I do remember being a TA. Um, we were TAs together, actually. Yeah, that's right. That's a long time ago. Uh, <laughs> Was it not? <laughs> um, do not take your job personally or do not take student reactions personally. I think there is this like deep desire, like you're here, you're at TD day, you care. You're a grad student, you love learning. That is maybe not the room you're gonna encounter. And to not take it personally when things aren't working or students are kind of spacing out, like it's not really about you. There's other things happening in their lives. And as an instructor, you have to start to learn more about people in general and to accept people in the ways in which they come. So for instance, students who cannot make eye contact while talking to you, that does not mean that they are disrespecting you or being rude to you. It means that's how they are communicating. Or students who are late because maybe they were dropping their child off at childcare and then didn't have enough time to get to the class. Like, it's not about you. It's not that they don't care about being there. It's that they have their, their stuff, right? And as instructors, the more we learn about all these different facets of life and the more open we are to saying, okay, that's okay. You come as you are. Um, then we could start taking, again, that ego out of it. It's not about me. It's not about how much they love statistics or how much they love this class. They have stuff. That's fine. I have stuff too. I'm going to show up late maybe one day. And then I don't want my students freaking out being like, well, my teacher came late one day. Like, you know, like we're all in this together kind of thing and showing them that humanity, I think is, is part of just entering into the world of teaching is that you have to kind of understand humanity in all its divergencies. I think kind of, you know, have one thing to add kind of stemming from the, the ideas that uh, both of you mentioned is that when, especially with the, the, the body language, because one thing that I just realized, and it's one of the one of the you know like positive positive feedbacks I got, is that I never show, and I don't like you know the, the S word, which is like you know like silly, um, but 
um, I was told that, you know, I make people not feel like inco they're incompetent. I think especially anyone who's teaching like a, you know, technical class um, or even not technical classes really, um, they come in with a lot of pressure already. And I feel like undergrads, some of them really take, you know, like they need to understand it and they want to show that they understand even before you teach a certain topic. Um, so for some reason, there's that pressure, right? And when they ask you questions, don't make them, you know, I try not to, you know, be conscious about how I how I say things and how I act, um, so that I don't really make them feel like they're incompetent in terms of learning certain topics. Um, I think that goes a long way because once they feel that you're, you know, you're like, you know, like when they ask you a question and you're like, well, you know, you should have learned this two years ago or you should have learned this, you know, in high school or something like that. Like no one likes to hear those things at all. Um, I'm sure none of us like like that. So be sure to not say those things. And then once you say them, the damage is kind of there and they totally close up like, to you and it takes a long time to repair, you know, what what sort of relationship that you're, you're trying to build with not just, you know, one student, but, but as a whole too. So, so it's very important. It's not just verbal, it's also, you know, like if you're sighing a lot, I know it's hard to like be conscious about these things, but, but, but yeah, do what you would like to be done to you, I guess, as a, as a student. Absolutely, I think that I remember one of the first times uh, I TA'd, um, I had a row of students in the back and the whole time they were just sitting there like this, looking at me. And I was, I thought they were having like the worst time of their lives. It was terrible. And I was spending like more and more hours every week trying to engage with them, smile, jokes, <laughs> nothing worked. But I actually got some of the best feedback um, in that class because, you know, the ways that we read body language might be very different than how folks are, you know, experiencing it. Mm -hmm. So really, you know, check in with yourself and, and, and think about ways that um, you might be over-interpreting things. <laughs> <laughs> but I think that to me, um, especially in the first year uh, of uh, your graduate st uh, studies uh, as MAs or PhDs, you're going to be teaching assistants uh, where you're going to either be running running tutorials, grading student papers, or running labs. Um, or, and you might also be a research assistant, in which you might work in a lab um, or work for your instructors as well. And then you'll be a student. You'll be taking up to three classes, reading those papers, reading those books, writing papers yourselves. Um, and then outside of all of this, uh, you might also be uh, doing some institutional service, being on committees, doing organizational work outside of the university. Um, you might be a parent. You might be taking care of family members uh, outside of the university. And so it is a lot, and it gets really overwhelming. And so we know the importance of supporting student wellness, but I think it's also really important to recognize the exhaustion and the burn out um, and and the fact that they are real and that they we are we do experience them and so many instructors including teaching assistants and teaching fellows struggle with with both exhaustion and burnout and so I was wondering uh, as our last question before we, we turn it to, to you all to see if you had any questions or suggestions or strategies um, whether you know is it possible to strike a balance? <laughs> or how do you strike a balance? Um, and what that might look like for you? Why are you laughing? Yes, me. <laughs> and why are you looking at me? <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> therapy. Do your own therapy. Get a therapist. I'm serious. You're going to need one to survive. But, um, in, in you know, all joking aside, I, I really do believe in the value of therapy. Uh, but for me... Uh, as a precarious worker, I'm not tenure track nor tenured. <laughs> um, it feels, it genuinely feels, and and you as graduate students, or if there are adjuncts in this room, uh, you are also precarious workers, and it will feel like you cannot afford, like literally cannot afford balance. Like I have to create my salary by the amount of courses I teach. The more courses I teach the kind of remote salary I end up getting. It's not great, but so it, it kind of feels like we don't have the luxury 
of balance and students are going to evaluate you and you want to, you know, you want to show that you're doing good and because you want to get grant money and, all, you know, like there's all these kind of things that we are working towards. Um, but we have to remember that that's a really toxic system to be in and we have to support each other in saying that like this system doesn't want our wellness. This system actually wants to grind us into the ground. It wants us to not take time for ourselves. It wants us to answer emails on the weekend. It wants us to answer emails at mid, like, but we have to support each other in putting up boundaries. So if you find that you have other TAs you're working well with, could you say, hey, is it okay if we come up with an email policy for this group of TAs that says, we're not gonna answer emails after, Five o'clock. I actually say three p.m. because that's like I like I really I like I tell my TAs do not like other outside of business hours, right? Like, or we're not going to answer things on the weekend. Like, what kind of boundaries can we set up for our own well-being in a system that does not want us to do that? And that requires us to kind of come together, brainstorm together, and work together. And maybe you're not going to get the leadership from your instructor, and that's okay. It's going to be frustrating, but you can rely, hopefully, on one another to say, what are some ways we could take care of each other in a system that does not want us to be supported, that does not offer very good benefits, that does not offer us the medical and mental health related insurance that we need. Like, there's lots of things kind of working against wellness here, but it's not that we can't create our own moments for it. And my other thing is to do what you need to to be present. And this kind of sounds a little cliche, but most of academia is forward thinking. The essay you have to get done, the things you have to read, the papers you have to grade, everything is bringing you into this forward inertia. However, all the things Paul and Megan have brought up, all these things about teaching and being present with students requires a, a presentness, a mindfulness in the present. So you have to do your own work as a human being to set yourself up for that. So when you are teaching, when you are working in relation to others, you're not somewhere else. You're able to pay attention to your students' body language. You're able to, to kind of reflect on your actions and what you're saying in the class. You're able to have that kind of self-reflexivity. And if you can't gift your students your self-reflexivity, if you can't gift yourself your own self-reflexivity, that's not really helpful to anyone. So this is a moment of your health is actually important to how you teach. So you have to do what you need to take care of yourself as well. Yeah, I'm going to echo a couple of things here. First off, therapy. It's great. Um, <laughs> and uh, if you are a grad student, you do have access to some benefits through the uh, graduate health plan, but you also have access to the mental health fund through the union. And that leads to my second point, which is get involved with the union. Um, there are people who are on this campus who are in the same position as you who do care about your wellness and it is about seeking out those connections and finding that community um, and that might be in the union it might be in the people that you share an office with it might be in mentors that you find but really finding those people who do care and who share the same values as you is really crucial to being able to find wellness and to set boundaries for yourself because it's really hard to hold your boundaries up and and to take care of yourself when no one else around you is. And so if you're surrounding yourself with people who are also like-minded and who are caring about the same things, that's going to be a lot easier. Um, and if you are also a grad student and you manage to make some friends in your department, um, there can also be ways to like engage in community care and like bring snacks into the office and like really just all of those little things that make you feel like a human. Those are going to be really crucial, especially in Kingston when it gets really cold and really dark in the winter. You're going to need those moments that like make you feel safe and sane. Um, and then also, again, uh, with email boundaries, even if that's not something that you can set up with the rest of the teaching team, figuring out what your own boundaries are and really sticking to them and also making that really explicit with your students. Um, so like I do not answer emails after 5 p.m. or on weekends. Um, and that is something that I tell my students. 
And sometimes I break that rule in my own brain and I will answer emails, but then I will use Outlook's uh, like pre-send function so that they don't know that I've broken my rules. Um, and so really making it clear that you have your own access to your time and your energy. Um, and having your own energy also means like caring for your physical needs in the classroom. And so for me, that means that when I run tutorials, I schedule in a break halfway through, even if it's only a 50 minute session, I have five minutes where we all go and get water or stretch or take care of ourselves. Um, and sometimes accounting for your own physical needs might look unconventional. Um, sometimes it means sitting down at the front of the classroom or rolling yourself around an active learning classroom and not sort of standing and being the role of lecturer that you've come to like know. Um, but doing what you need to do in order to be comfortable and as Dan said, like make it so that you can be present in those moments. It might not always look like how you expect it to look and that's actually completely okay. Yeah, I, I say that boundaries are very, very important. I still am a, a, a pretty a big mess um, in my in my life. I started a consulting job, so like it's nonstop. And uh, yeah, sorry, not about my life, uh, but like, <laughs> like, but set set boundaries, like you know, and and be, be like like Megan was saying, be explicit about it, so that you know your expectations are are met. With, with the students also know your expectation, and they know your expectations too. Um, yeah, because sometimes when you have the boundaries in your head and you're not really ex communicating it to to your students, then they they don't know that, right? And then they'll send you emails at midnight and wanting you to respond in in, in ten minutes. And there are some students that that do that. But again, so you know, set out the boundaries. You know, make it sort of documented if you want. You know, have it in an email that send it to everybody so that that you know, to, just to guarantee you that. Everybody's on the same page. Um, related to that, uh, know your limits. Know your limits in terms of how much you can, um, you know, help or be, you know, with, and um, you know, like a student or be involved in the student's, you know, coursework or, or life for that matter. Um, and know that it's going to change. It's not like you can be, you know, on certain times, you know, when when you don't have to, like, you know you do assignments yourself or you're not doing exams then you might be more to you know be more open to get involved and then they can come and talk to you about you know their lives and what goes on in their life but it might change you know towards the end of the summer you know the the semester you might get really busy so ask yourself you know what what's my limit today or this week how, how much can I get involved and respect that for yourself for your own you know mental health too um, so I think that's more in the class management kind of aspect in terms of how to, you know, how to survive. Um, and as a graduate student, just, just, it's hard, just take care of yourself. Try to have one of those, you know, I don't know if anybody watch Parks and Rec, but like treat yourself day. Like, you know, do, just go, go do whatever you want, you know, have, have one of those things in a while. You don't have to feel that you have to study or you have to mark assignments or you have to answer emails all the time. And I felt that. Um, I still felt that to the last second of my PhD. So not to say that it's perfect, but try try to squeeze in whatever you know guilty or not guilty pleasures that you have. Um, execute them once in a while, and and know that it's okay. You're a human, right? Like you can. I, I had so many of these. Like um, my husband lives. You know, it was in Montreal, but I was over here. So many times I would just drive, and just to you know, so that it can be with someone. Um, and in you know in the car, I would thinking you know what I should be reading a paper. I should be I should have you know I should have stayed home you know in my apartment and just write my thesis. But know that you know it's silly. And at the end of the day, you you'll finish and it, everything will be okay. So so enjoy the moment and you know just try to you know be you know take as much happiness out of the whole experience at Queens as, as much as you can. There's one more thing I want to say. Um, in if you're a grad student here, or if you're an academic in general, odds are you have a bit of a perfectionist complex, and that's <laughs> A-OK. -okay. But I do want to say that not everything you do has to be the best thing you've ever done. Um, and learning to prioritize 
what things should be closer to the best thing you've ever done <laughs> and what things really don't matter is what's going to let you set those boundaries and figure out that work-life balance. Um, because the things that fill you up with joy and bring you fulfillment and get you closer to like the end goal that you actually want to be at, whether or not that's like a career focus or like just a sense of relationship with people, those are the things that you should pour as much time and energy as you can into. And the things that you find drain you, get them done, but it doesn't have to be perfect. Um, and the sooner you learn that, the better that your life is going to be in grad school. Thank you. And I think that that's amazing advice. And I, I, the panelists clearly are, are somewhat perfectionist because it's 9.59. So <laughs> like right on time. Um, I, think, I think if I can sum up some of the panel today, it's that community is important. Teaching is not a solo endeavor, whether you're a TA, a course instructor, a teaching fellow, find people that can be your community for, for yourself, for your research, for your teaching, and find resources. This, this isn't solo in that you have to sit and figure it out on your own. There are resources across campus to help in all areas of this. Teaching, come talk to us. There's research resources. There are mental health resources and wellness resources through campus and student health and wellness. So find all of those pieces that you need to support you through your teaching on campus. Um, and come talk to us at the CTL because we'll help point you in the right direction even if we're not the right people to help. <laughs> um, so with that, it is exactly 10 o'clock. Uh, there is a 20 minute break before the next session will start. And we welcome everyone into the atrium to grab some coffee, a tea, a drink, um, and some snacks before our next session starts at 10 20.